think, as promised, we will start to talk more about holy relationship this afternoon. Because it's, it's very, very different from relationship as we've known it. It's like a, almost like your mind gets rinsed of, of all the beliefs and concepts about relationship. <coughs> You come to a point of meaninglessness, and then you ask the Holy Spirit to provide the meaning, to give it. And it, the Spirit won't give you a meaning on the timeline, and won't project out and give you a future meaning. It will just give it to you moment by moment. And that is how the relationship is, is coming in. So, there was a time, I think it was probably a couple years ago, when I was giving a session at our monastery, Course in Miracles Monastery over in Utah, and there were three aspects that came down in order to dive into this high relationship, this new relationship, and the three were undefined, Guided collaboration. Maybe. Just a moment. Undefined. <laughs> Undefined, guided. Guided. Collaboration. Samarbeid. Like a feeling of working together. And um, it was such a strong guidance that right away it was very impactful. It's like a like a wave hitting, uh, it just had a huge impact, because it's, those aren't things that typically are, are part of relationships in this world, at all. Um, the undefined part was, is very, very scary to the ego, because um, I had, I was sharing those qualities uh, with groups as I would travel around a bit here and there, and one woman said, oh, I, I like all my relationships very defined. <laughs> it was like, oh, I don't even want to go there with the first one, that's just way too open uh, to not have a definition for it. And the guided part is important. Meta and I were talking about that when we were driving up and get, pulling up to the parking lot, how if there's not the guidance, uh, behind it, then it's the same with everything in life that we try in this world. Without guidance, it's, it just goes, it's the ego. <laughs> you could just say, if it's not guided, it's ego. Because <laughs> the, the guidance of the Spirit is always designed to, un, to dissolve the ego. And, and then the collaboration part was very important, because there's like a synergy of of being used together in some helpful way that benefits the whole, that blesses the whole. All the skills and abilities that are there are like a pool, and the Spirit can just pull on the pool to use the pool for the good of the whole. So, um, how that's played out for me actually over the years is that um, it's come in many different kind of collaborations, where the undefined part was was just really being willing to just be wide open and just kind of show up without having any preconceptions <coughs> or, or strong plans and ideas. It really meant don't have an agenda. Don't, don't try to bring an agenda from the past into this space that will be used. The, the guided part was it's purely inspirational, so you, you have to be in touch with what truly inspires you. And when you're really in touch with what inspires you, then the Spirit will use skills, abilities, and will bring people, resources, everything in to fulfill that inspiration. The inspiration has to come first. It's not like you make a plan of what you want to do. You have to have that spark of inspiration. And the collaboration part, I just see 
Whereas before, relationships were always these very defined linear kind of things that had beginnings and endings. The collaborations have come in many, many different forms and configurations over these years for me. Um, just showing up to do tours or to do gatherings, even coming here for example, all of us coming here to do this is, is a huge collaboration. This, this involves a huge collaboration, we, if we really are honest. Um, first of all, we're in Ocean's house. We're in his living room. It's like a little mini five, six day community in Ocean's house. And I, I like the symbol of Ocean because whereas rivers have beginnings and ends, streams have beginnings and ends, the ocean doesn't. You can't find a beginning to it, it just connects. Some of it's frozen, <laughs> some of it's frozen a bit to the North Pole and the South Pole, but that's melting even too, <laughs> pretty quickly. <laughs> There's a lot of metaphors in there. So, so here we are, we've been brought together for a collaboration in the ocean, in the ocean's living room. And, and that's, a, that's a nice symbol. Also, um, you know, oftentimes when I go to different countries, I don't speak the languages, so there's a lot of collaborations that occur through translations. It's not really about the translation, it's more like connecting in mind, in a real telepathic way. And, and you need that in order to have a flowing translation. Uh, because when I was just recently in Finland, I mentioned earlier that uh, the first translator, she was trying to follow the words and understand the words that were coming out, so she could understand first the words and then translate them. And after I, it came out very deep in the first three or four minutes, she just stared at me, just like, like, I can't translate that because the look was, I can't translate it because I don't understand what you said. Not that she couldn't understand my accent, because I was speaking slowly and clearly, but she couldn't comprehend the ideas, and therefore she couldn't translate them. And I just, she just stared at me for a little while and I just said, just let the words come through, but don't try to understand <laughs> what's coming through. And I've had others that have told me, wow, it, it was almost like, they felt like they, instead of translating, they had to channel, because they were so linking up and, and wanting the words to just come through in a helpful way, but they couldn't actually follow all the ideas. They, their mind wasn't at a place where they could even comprehend them. So, uh, I've enjoyed that with many, many translators showing up and they usually are very spontaneous too, they're, they're not professional translators. It's, it's so rare, out of all the travels I've done where, where there's been a professional translator that's actually hired to do the translations. It's so, so rare. Most of the time it's just people coming forth saying, can I do this? I feel called to do this. It just comes out. And also with travel there's enormous amounts of logistics, so there has to be a huge collaboration there. So in one sense, these kind of gatherings like we're doing now is, is, a, is kind of an example of how we can live our life, but it takes a lot of trust to do that. It's not just like an event where you can just shut it off and go home and go back to another way of living. This becomes your way of living, where you're so trusting that everything's going to be there, everything's going to show up, everything will fall into place, everything that's needed will be provided. You gain a confidence in that more and more and more. And you see that these collaborative relationships, which are so based on purpose, don't have all the, the rigidity, the structure, the, the expectations, the demands that, that linear relationships have. You, it's for a higher purpose, but the purpose is not to stay together. And more than that, the purpose of the relationship really doesn't have it doesn't really have a form goal. That's another thing that's striking that linear relationships, when you enter into it, 
there's some kind of <coughs> purpose in the commitment that you'll stay together. You see how it's got a, a, go a form goal. It's got a, an, whether it's an overt, you know, talked about goal or whether it's kind of implied. And you know that it's implied if you never talk about it and yet when one decides mm -hmm. to leave or starts spending less time in the relationship, you will hear about it. It was, it was implied that, that you would stay together. That was a form goal. Um, I don't know if we have a course book with us or not, <laughs> or the course gathering, but we have one there. No, no, no. English. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's fine. She's got one that's just as easy. Because uh, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a line in it that I think, I think would be a lot of fun. I'll bring the Bible. And a golden package. Oh, there we there are. are. Perfect. <laughs> Whatever do you want. This is perfect. It's in a, it's in a gold. It almost looks like a candy box. Yeah. <laughs> it's more chocolate. And this, you know, when I was talking about these undefined, guided, uh, collaborative relationships, um, this part <laughs> came to mind. Um, Yeah, this whole lesson would be, would be great, but this is the part. Yeah, this is, this is, a, to me it's an amazing, amazing paragraph. If you can just get the slightest little grasp of what he's talking about right here, you are home free. Because when you first read it, it's like, what? are you saying here? This is from Lesson 135, Workbook Lesson 135 in A Course in Miracles. It's kind of in the, it's the longest lesson in the book, and it's kind of in the middle, smack dab in the middle of it. And it so goes against all of our conditioning that um, you really have to open your mind wide to let it in. And then if you start to apply it to your relationships, it even gets more exciting. <laughs> Because imagine I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to read the whole paragraph. It's just one paragraph. But I, while I'm reading the paragraph, I want you to think about this paragraph in the context of your relationships. So, like Maria brought up the example of what's been going on for her this week, and you were saying this is what I'm dealing with. <coughs> so now let's think think about that relationship in this context. Because this is an amazing paragraph, and then we'll go into it. Okay, it says, A healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan. Although, it cannot know the outcome which is best, the means by which it is achieved, nor how to recognize the problem that the plan is made to solve. Those are only three things you can't, you can't know. You, in order to experience the, the joy of the first part, you just have to, you cannot know any of those three things afterwards. Again, a healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan. Doesn't that sound relaxing? Uh, if you never, ever, ever had to plan anything, wouldn't that be, as carefree as you could ever, ever even imagine. A healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan, although it cannot know the outcome which is best, the means by which it is achieved, nor how to recognize the problem that the plan is made to solve. So you have to be clueless about the outcome, I mean really clueless. Clueless about the outcome, clueless about the means, and clueless about the problem that is meant to be solved. Clueless of the problems, clueless of the, of the means, and clueless of the outcome. That's what he's saying here. Now, the next part is he's saying, 
the mind, it must misuse the body in its plans until it recognizes this is so. So in other words, until you meet those conditions of those three things, then the body will be misused. And we know what comes from the misuse of the body. There will be guilt, there will be fear, there will be doubt, there will be shame. So those three, without those three conditions being met, it must use the body in its plan until it recognizes this is so. But, when it has accepted this is true, then is it healed and lets the body go. So it's pointing us towards this mystical union with spirit. I mean, why would you even need a body if you're spirit? You know, it's obviously if the ego made it, the Holy Spirit can use it while you believe you have it. But it's not going to be your goal. And it's not like some of those religions that say that when you die, there's so many thousands of bodies that will live together in immortality. There, you get an immortal body and you carry your body with you and I think one group said there's 144,000. It's not a lot out of 7 billion people. There's 144,000 that get to keep their bodies. The rest are probably burned in the fire or something. But, you know, actually you start to realize that, that the last part is the mind is healed and lets the body go. And there's even a part in the Course, in the Manual for Teachers, that says that there are those who have laid aside the body in order to increase their helpfulness. It's interesting, increase. Not laid aside the body to decrease their helpfulness, but to increase their helpfulness, showing that the whole thing's going on in, in the mind. And, and the body, when it doesn't serve the mind's unification anymore, it's just not there to be perceived. It's, it's just, you let go of the whole body and the whole world. So let's try to be practical with this. Like if we apply this to Maria's situation, because you were talking about the things that were going on on a daily basis. That would just mean that in order to have a shift, I was calling it life coach, eternal life coach. You can put eternal in front of it to emphasize that it's not biological. Eternal life coach that you would be relieved of all planning and all figuring it out if you can just meet those three conditions. The one, first one is, uh, you don't know the outcome which is best. So, that's asking us to be really humble, very open-minded and humble and say, I don't know the outcome which is best because you see how guilty you can get when you think you know the form or the outcome, how it should look, and when it doesn't match that inner picture. Like, he or she should act this way, should behave this way, there's certain um, guidelines and rules that have to be adhered to, and when the behavior doesn't match that, then, then that doesn't work either. There's, there's a lot of guilt that comes up and gets generated from that. So you can't, we just right off the bat have to let go of the outcome. You see how it fits in with my guidance from the Spirit that undefined, guided collaborations could handle this great. Because, <coughs> you know, if it's undefined you don't have a structure already set in place. You don't have a standard that the relationship has to meet. So you're not constantly comparing, you know, even about little things. Like, hmm, he said he would call, he didn't call. He said he would call, he didn't call. And then after about seven hours go by, he said he would call, but he didn't call. You know, it's, there's a, an irritation that starts to arise. Or come over for dinner, or you know, these kind of things that can involve expectations um, and agreements and so on and so forth. But just think, if, you don't, if you're not having an outcome which is best, and you're joining in peace of mind, if that's what you both want for each other, we'll say, uh, is peace of mind. You would rather be happy than let anything at all come in the way of your happiness. You can start to see it's important to be able to start to let go of the outcomes. And people sometimes will say, that's not practical at all. But remember, this is Jesus Christ <laughs> dealing with us. This isn't like, this isn't like a theory. 
you don't, you know, it's, it's the master, it's, it's the one that's transcended time and space and, and doesn't even exist in form at all. It's just like the living presence of God's love that's saying these things. So, <coughs> in some sense you pay attention, you say. You don't have to get into a debate or an argument with it. It's like, okay, well, all right, if that's the case, then, hmm, that's a lot. No outcomes. Okay, no outcomes. Also, the means by which it is achieved. Imagine that you don't ever have to put any thought into the means, either. Means. Yeah. Like, how to keep, how to keep someone happy, how to keep the relationship alive. What do you do? You know, books are written on this. Lots of books and workshops and, you know, it just goes on and on. This is a big topic. You could become very wealthy if you, you, you may not have a clue what's going on, but if you just write a book on the means <laughs> to keep relationships going, you've got a bestseller. And you could be confused, disoriented, and really in a pathetic state of mind, but if you wrote a book on the means to keep your relationship together, you'd be a bestseller. Because, because that's what the ego wants, it's got, its outcome is keeping the relationship together. And then the last one, nor how to recognize the problem that the plan is made to solve. That means that God has a plan, but whenever you try to recognize the problem that the plan is meant to solve, everything goes haywire. <laughs> as soon as you define the problem, as soon as you say, you sit down with your partner and say, listen, we got to talk. You've got a problem. <laughs> and it's not going anywhere because, because you, you're not capable of recognizing the problem that the plan is made to solve. In other words, what if the ego is the problem that the plan is made to solve? And in the end, Jesus doesn't want you to recognize the ego. He wants you to forgive it. And so much forgive it that you don't even recognize it. You know, you, you, you don't even know what a problem is. You get into such a state of, of joy and ecstasy that you, you don't even know if somebody said, that's ego, you're like, what? That's, what is that? You, know, you want to be so clean, so pure, that you can't even recognize it. So, and the, and the reward is, but when it has accepted that this is true, these three conditions, then it is healed, the mind is healed, and lets the body go. It's, that one paragraph says so much, but it, it also tells you that you, that's why you have to trust the Holy Spirit for everything. You, you can't trust the Holy Spirit too much. It's not like anybody can ever accuse you of being obsessed with listening and following the Holy Spirit. You can't get obsessed. <laughs> or you are too dependent on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> You need to get some balance in your life, you know, you're just way too dependent on the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you, you know, there's, there's, you can never be accused of that. In fact, Jesus is telling us that that's the only way to be peaceful, is to become completely God dependent or Spirit dependent. You can't be too dependent on that. So, this it just goes on, the next paragraph is just basically saying, if you don't follow what was just said in, in that paragraph, then this is what happens. Enslavement of the body to plans the unhealed mind sets up to save itself, must make the body sick. That's what's going to happen. It doesn't matter whether you're emotionally sick, whether you're physically sick, fatigued, worn out, whatever, it's all versions of of sickness. If you're not able to follow that top paragraph, then, then basically that's where it's headed. Must make the body sick. It is not free to be the means of helping in a plan which far exceeds its own protection, and which needs its service for a little while. In this capacity is health assured. So, if you find your, your purpose, if you find your function, if you find your calling, you've got it all. Your happiness and your function are one. When you tune in to that calling, that's it. But remember, it's not a form kind of thing. You can't say, I'm, I'm guided to be a, a monk or a nun, and say, and think that you've solved it. 
with just some label and conforming to some kind of label. It's much broader than that. So, what Kirsten and I can talk about here is that how our lives have seemed to unfold in the sense that with these undefined guided collaborations, there's, it's like a pool of resources that the Spirit can draw on in any moment. And there's an endless reserve, an endless supply of whatever's needed to extend the peace and the joy. But you, you don't hold yourself or another body to like rigid definitions of, of how this has to go. And we could give you countless examples. I guess one of the most recent ones was last night, um, Jason and Kirsten were on a call. We're doing a whole tour, after we do a tour of Europe, we're doing a tour of South Africa, the whole country. And so this tour planning has been going on since last fall, I believe. And there's been all kinds of emotions that have come up and it's a big team too. It's not just like two or three people planning it. It's like a big collaboration because it's all around the country. But, but you had a call last night and that was, that was like an opportunity to practice this holy relationship uh, without having outcomes set in mind for what has to happen on the call, what format outcomes must come from the call, what means we're going to do to make it happen. You know, the typical planning meetings are very ego-based. Maybe you could just share a bit about, about how that experience was. Yes, we started to get a feeling about the accommodation uh, just at one part of the tour. And the accommodation had already been set uh, for David and Francis and Jason and I to be in two houses and then to travel to a retreat venue. <coughs> and for some reason it just kept coming to mind again, oh we have to communicate about the accommodation, even though there is no problem with the accommodation and it's already been set up. So it wasn't really about the accommodation, but that was just something that kept coming to mind that we could feel from the spirit. It's a, it's a starting point to join. And this group who joined together as the tour team, Initially, about three or four of them expressed <coughs> that they wanted to live in spiritual community together. and uh, Or just in spiritual community, perhaps together. And when they started joining on calls together, just the ego came up. And so much intensity came up just in joining on these calls that they were shocked. They're like, whoa, this is really intense. We just, we had no idea. So we took... Uh, the idea of spiritual community off the table altogether. Just don't let that be a goal. Just join together now with what's given, which is tour planning for this tour. And even with that, it's just been a lot of healing. Just coming together to try to join over, a, over one decision, like how long a retreat would be, or the venue for the retreat. Um, and so they would come, and, and of course beneath the purpose for the tour team is the purpose of awakening. Like each of those members of the tour team want to heal their mind. And so coming together is like holy relationship, or it is a symbol of holy relationship. And so the projection of the attack thought of the ego is just going on to each other. You're opinionated. You're not listening. You're pretending to be spiritual. <laughs> Why are you saying it's guided? How do you know it's guided? I don't feel that at all. You know. And so the bouncing, bouncing around um, and the intensity and the emotion was just coming up on every single call for them. Uh, and so each time Jason joined on a call, um, he was just there like as the presence. And, and it was very helpful. And somehow, even with all of the healing and the logistics, you know, the, the tour did continue to get planned <laughs> and the events got, got booked and people are signing up to come. So on the surface of things, everything's, everything's just flowing. Um, so the call last night, there'd been quite a few emails 
going back and forth with expressions of um, what's not working, uh, projection, feeling excluded, um, feeling that the spirit, the ego was masquerading as the spirit and certain people. <laughs> So we joined on this call just with this prompt around accommodation, but the, the closer we came to the call, even more emails were coming. Why do we have to join around accommodation? It's already set. I think, again, this must be the, spirit, the ego masquerading as the spirit. Surely we don't have to talk about these logistics again. But we just kept, just stayed in prayer and trusted that even with all of these expressions, it's like, no, there's nothing to address. There's nothing to answer. Just allow, allow, allow through the emails. And then finally we came together on the call last night. And just joining there and sharing the purpose at the beginning of the call that it is purely for awakening and it is the deepest answer to the prayer of the heart. And we all just sank into this presence together. Yeah, I can't really even describe what happened. Other than with this very clear intention of joining in the truth and joining in the Christ, even the expressions that came, because it was open for expression, from a grievance or from joy, whatever the expression would be, those expressions just really came from such a deep place in the heart that everyone sank into the presence afterwards. And those that seemed to have the deepest grievances with each other, they expressed that on the call and just expressed the awareness that that's what it was all for. Tear it down. <laughs> no outcomes. No outcomes. See, tear down. Okay. <laughs> and at the beginning of the call, one of the participants, uh, she's actually was on logistics, and so she does all the spreadsheets, and she was expressing this this real anxiousness at the beginning, like. I feel like we're meant to deal with the logistics. We need to deal with this accommodation issue. It's like an elephant in the room. And until we discuss this accommodation, I won't be able to join on, join and rest in the core. And so just the spirit came through in the most beautiful way about this section. Again, like the healed mind is not planned. But in a practical way, like if you're not experiencing, I need to nothing. If you're not experiencing that kind of peace, then that kind of energy can't be leading the call. You know, it can't be the main point of the call. Otherwise, you've decided to find the problem and are trying to solve the problem through the logistics. But really, the purpose of the relationship and the purpose of the call is joining in the truth, joining in the experience of, of who we are. So yeah, that was the outcome. And then the... There, there was an exploration. There was a group of three who hadn't really joined in person very much with the fourth, and they were going to go on a field trip together and go and check out the accommodation that was booked and another couple of accommodation options. Not with the goal of finding the perfect accommodation, but, I mean, that will be the outcome. <laughs> but really, the, the purpose was joining and just spending that time yeah. It's like a, a perfect example of, of this sense that that all of us have been trained, all of us have all this past learning and conditioning to be problem solvers. We've actually come to earth to be problem solvers. And, and then there's this crazy belief in learning that you can actually learn how to be a competent problem solver. That's, that's insane. If you, if you really aren't a problem solver to begin with, that you could even be a good problem solver. 
I was in university for 10 years and I think most of the skills that I was given was, was in problem solving. I, it's, I, the lesson says the healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan and that was my major in university, planning. Urban planning. I was actually doing a degree in learning how to plan. And then the course comes along and it says, you can't. You're, you are relieved of the belief that you must, but you have to meet these three conditions. But those are conditions of trust. And that's, I hear that in the call, there was a lot of trust. It's like, you know, it's like having a grandmother or grandfather that just is smiling at you all the time going, it's all going to work out fine. Just relax, it's all working out fine. Just constantly having that reminder that it is all working out fine. It's only because we've been identified with being the problem solvers. And, and in order to be a problem solver, you have to first be a problem finder. <laughs> and that's really dangerous in relationships, you know, to have that as your mission. <laughs> a problem finder. Imagine that, you know. And see how different that is from, behold the Christ, behold the perfection, behold the perfect innocence, problem finder in place of that. So it sends you off in a very, you might say, difficult <laughs> direction because it's an impossible direction. You're, we're not ever going to find the problem. So when we insistently try to do that in relationships, you might say that's just a good definition of projection. All we're doing is projecting something that we can't handle or that we don't want to handle in our consciousness and awareness and then looking to find it outside, which leads to blame, which leads to guilt. Yes, Maria. With this whole uh, reflection of the ex-boyfriend and this maybe, and should we be together or not, and him, him wanting answers and investigating and all of that, is that, I mean, is the way to see it, is it like he's just a reflection actually of the one ego, my ego also being so scared of, of this, let's not plan, let's just stay open, let's just be in the love, and I don't know, you know, this I don't know mind, and then it's reflected through him, this really being so afraid, or is that the way to see it, or? Yeah, I think it, it can be acted out on the screen, so sometimes you can maybe see it occasionally in you, and then in, in the Maria character, and sometimes in, in his character, you know, but, but it is this fear that we were talking about all day, the, the fear of without the definition, then what is it? You know, it's the, it's the ego's tremendous, tremendous fear of meaninglessness. Like it's, like somehow the definition is going to give it some meaning and then we'll be fulfilled with this definition. And I think if you want to trace it even back further, it's like, you know, since everything seems to relate to God in this journey, then the problem is, is when we're trying to define ourself, when we're trying to define our brothers and sisters or define our partner, we actually still believe it's possible to define God. Because we're just trying to do it in another direction, you know, where it's like, but, but isn't that what theology is about? All these struggles we've had on the planet around theology, theological clashes, oh well, your theology is different than mine, and you believe what you believe, and I'll believe what I believe. And then this curious thing that I've heard teachers talk about, where you have to agree to disagree. That's, that's unbelievable. <laughs> that's just absolutely unbelievable. You can't ever come to harmony if you agree to disagree. Just think of what you're saying. You're, you're saying disagreement is inevitable, so let's agree to it. You know, and that's the same Sometimes I'll hear arguments around pluralism and um, pluralism accepting that there are many different 
things, many different views. Um, why don't we just accept there are many different views? Uh, and that leads to the saying of accept our differences. But that's not the teachings of the Course. It's actually saying accept your sameness and you'll see that differences disappear. Mm -hmm. That you really are all the same. There's really just one of us here. And, and so, I do feel like that's exactly what's happening. That's, that's just a symptom of the fear in the mind to, to let go of the self-concept, which is what all the definitions are. And it takes a lot of trust, um, because of the conditioning. Like, you start off with a partner, and then it, it has to transfer to everything in your awareness. Uh, so, like, if you, then you would start to transfer to your son, that's another whole thing. Um, but, you know, you can st start to see that that's the way the spirit will work. It's gonna, it's, it's, it, to let go of definitions around that, then that, that requires a, a, a lot of faith, a lot of trust as well. Because it's really, there's a self-concept that's down there, and the ego made it up. And then the mind is forever trying to live up to that self-concept and not doing a really good job of it. It's, that's where the guilt comes in. It's always falling a little short of whatever those concepts are. I always think of August for August Rush and, and how August Rush was in that movie. He was, he was, the, he was bringing down the music and he was, he had, this, all this music pouring through him, just wanting to radiate out, ended up conducting, you know, even, and everything. And, but he was, in the movie, he was the most undefined character in the movie. The, 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 the parents were going through all kinds of stuff, and the bullies, and people trying to help him, projecting problems onto him, and, and he was out in the fields, <laughs> swinging around his arms, and just in this glory of really, I'd say, spirit, you know, in the music of spirit. And that's quite a, a striking that you have actually named your son August, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a reminder, like a constant reminder of that too. Right? So let's, we'll just see if anybody else has, wants to explore this in terms of relationship. Yeah, mom, I'm curious about my dog, because I can't figure out what role dogs play in this game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, right now it's my closest relationship. <laughs> and I just, uh, I can of course use the words undefined, guided collaboration, but still, it seems like I have a responsibility somehow. It's, it's, it seems somehow one way. I, I would just like to know how to Make a relationship with my dog. <laughs> is, this the, is this the dog with the big brown eyes that I posted on Facebook? <laughs> you can eye gaze with Shanti <laughs> that could be the, <laughs> and get lost in, in a good way in those big brown eyes. <laughs> I told you when I posted that I would get more likes than anything else that I could post on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> that was her, that was your dog, yeah. But I think with dogs and cats and pets, um, yeah, they give us those same kind of opportunities to to like live and let live, to let be, you know, to if there's any kind of control issues, they get projected out onto the animals. If there's anything that's unresolved in consciousness. It, it just seems to get put, put out there, and um, yeah, in that sense it helped me when I traveled around so much because there was a stretch of time when I was traveling where I kept every house I would stay in, because I wasn't staying in motels or hotels, every house I stayed in there was this dynamic going on between the pet owner and the pet, and I got to see a range of issues. 
And oftentimes I would visit enough that I would see if, if, if a parent had an issue with a child, um, and then the, ch or the child grew up and the child left the home, you know, to go on to school or whatever, then I would watch, I would go back and visit, and I would see the parent projecting the same issues on the dog <laughs> as they were on the child, but the child was gone, so they had, they had something to aim at. And I would just be fascinated, like, wow, this is amazing dynamics. How the mind is trying to get rid of something by seeing it outside itself. So, that might be the, the thing when you, it's still a mirroring going on, but you, you can really just take a look at, at your feelings around it. Even feelings of responsibility, like being locked in. Now, I took my relationships with my animals the other direction, where I would telepathically communicate where I was on my spiritual journey, invite them to join me, and as I became less dependent on medicines and doctors, in their case veterinarians and so forth, we, we decided to go down a walk of faith and trust together. And we had many amazing experiences together, from these, you might say, this agreement that we had in mind, that we weren't going to, like with tripod, I, I promised her she would not, I would not get the medical model involved with her in any way. And she really took that agreement sincerely. The only time I remember once when some people tried to put medicine on her, when I wasn't there, she screamed like she was being raped. I mean, it was really, she screamed, really, because it, it was like a violation of the, of the agreement. So I used it in, in just for my spiritual learning. And it was awesome to see with Tripod, who really, this was the cat, who was a mystic at heart, because that was her calling. She was coming to join this, the community, and she's very much a mystic. Um, and when it was time to go traveling, one time we went on a, off traveling for seven months, and it was always the calling first. What is the calling? Where are we to go? And just trusting that whatever tripod would need, it, would need would also show up. So the thought of have, having responsibility for a cat wouldn't, wasn't a thought in the mind that could be any kind of factor in terms of the, the guidance to go out and share and extend you know, in a high way. <coughs> uh, it was more that she was there in support of the ministry. So she was there in support of everything, including the travels. <laughs> And we would just watch in amazement as to how she would arrange her cat sitters. <laughs> yeah, she would. We would you, sometimes you go away, you get a B and B or something. We would leave, vacate, and then she would arrange cat sitters to come <laughs> for her while we were gone. We had a phone call one time from this woman that we'd never met. She said, "I found your peace house on the website, and." Uh, I'm just feeling, and we were praying, like, okay, someone needs to show up for a tripod. And she said, I'm really feeling strongly called to come and stay at your little peace house in Cincinnati. <laughs> and we said, well, we're away traveling right now, but the cats are there, tripod and her sister, Angel. And they would love to have someone come. She said, oh my God, that's what I'm meant to do. <laughs> so she came, we left, the key was left out already. So she came and she looked after the cats. And carried on her way. We never met her. Yeah. Well, on, that journey, on that trip we didn't. But every time it was like whatever is needed is going to be provided. So it's constantly just putting this, put the kingdom first, you know, all things should be added, including here for the pets and the animals. They're not, like nothing's excluded outside of, outside of the plan. And then you just get to see, you know, where you, if there is some kind of codependence or a feeling of responsibility, you know, for the pets, if there's some kind of routine set up, and there, then there's a dependency on the routine, just even seeing that and being willing to give that over, you know, is it truly guided, whatever the routine may be? I think this is what it means too by letting go of thinking you have to know about the means, because 
you know, it, it's, it, it would almost be more like a fairy tale, like if you thought, okay, I'm going to follow my heart, I'm going to use my skills in very joyful, happy ways that extend love and peace, and uh, everything else, all the practicalities will be handled. Of course, if you had that kind of attitude, it would, it would require you had that trust, because there's conditioning that says, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, there's even a history that will say, oh, be realistic, that's not going to happen. And yet, that's the way it seemed to go in the, in the parable of David, where there's all these skills and abilities that, that got used in ways that I couldn't even comprehend or even fathom, but, but it was based on the trust that I, I am to be peaceful, I am to heal, I am to extend this healing and this peace, and then things all came in. It, it just, it inverts the whole world where, you know, learning how to give as God gives is perfectly reflected back to you, but the world says, don't be ridiculous, um, you have to handle all these other practical things first, and then make time, <coughs> carve time out, out of all, out of all these logistics for your spirit time, you know. And that's the way that it seems when the mind is, is, is in guilt and in fear and in scarcity. It's really upside down, it's not the truth at all, it's just the way that it seems when you're viewing the world through upside down perception. And then when you start trusting and you have these miracles happen and your skills and abilities are still there, they're still getting used in most amazing ways, everything starts to turn around. It's the, the turning point's the shakiest because you're like, oh, 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 it's like you're afraid something's going to happen. It's like, then you go around and you go, oh, oh, it's like, oh. If I had known this, I would have done this years ago, if I had known it was this easy, if this was this natural. But, you know, that's the, that's the thing, we, we have to trust and, and we have to let go of some of the conventional ways in which we think the needs will be met. That's still trying to control the means. Like Cecilia and I were talking about, this idea of writing skills and, and doing this, this paper or this thesis and trying to do it in. And right now that's part of helping, you know, help the means to feed the children and do these other things. And there's skills there that can be used. And yet there's this big, like, calling, I think, inside, which is using those skills in the most impactful way um, that will touch far more people will say, or a much broader range than you could even imagine. And the, the Spirit is, is calling for that, and that's why these collaborations are so important. Whatever one has can offer, they can offer it. That's, that's how this whole retreat came about. Ocean had a space. We had three different organizers, and there was lots of communications that took place, and then, you know, one thing just clicked in and clicked in and clicked in and we're coming. Here we come and we're going we're gonna to do it. And, and it just unfolded and it flowed. And that's the way your whole life can be. That's the way your life is designed to go. To be in that gentle unfolding and flow. So, to me, I'm always, like for me, instead of looking for problems, I'm looking for collaborations. I'm like all over the planet. You want to collaborate? You? Anybody? <laughs> okay, here we go, we got to collaborate. You know, then I'm getting all excited. So we have all these projects that's going on. People in our community can tell you about many, many, many endless <laughs> projects. But they're just endless opportunities for collaboration. Because it's the collaborative vibe. And the other thing is, we're not collaborating for profit. So we're not trying to we don't have a product in mind. We don't have a commerce or selling something in mind. We don't, we're, we don't have that goal of producing something. We're the most ambitionless group of people I've ever met. 
We're not lazy, but we don't have any ambition either. Uh, you know, we're, we're not trying to change the world, we're not trying to produce something. Uh, you know, in, in a strange way, it's like, I don't know, it's like peace of mind is the productivity. That's, that's our highest productivity, is our peacefulness. And it, it's not worth a damn thing in the world, but, but then again, the world's not real. So, you know, you don't, you don't have to make it fit with the world. You don't try to, to work it in and hope that it works out. You're not looking for rewards from the world. You're not looking for to win some kind of Oscar or Emmy or some kind of Grammy or some kind of award for your peace. Peace is its own reward. It doesn't need it. A worldly reward because it's everything. It's beautiful. Okay. No, no, no. He was just going, yay. There we go, Marianne. See that? No, it's like holy relationship in the context of the Course is sometimes described that way, but then again it's speaking as if the separation happened. So Jesus is throwing out his rungs on the ladder of practicality. So I would say, you know, he says that the ego made the world and the ego made the body, so you might say that the ego set the default for this world as as interpersonal relationships. And then as you give it over to the Holy Spirit and say, purify me, purify my mind, purify my consciousness, you kind of go up the rung and the relationships get used for mirroring, more mirroring, more letting go, more letting go. And then holy relationship would still probably, we could say, be defined in interpersonal terms, but the whole point of holy relationship, which is to heal the perception is to take you towards the holy instant, which is really non-perceptual. And the relationship with God. Yeah, and, and a communion, God. yes. It's a communion with God. So it's often used by the ego to make another safe new haven. It's often used that way because the ego wants to hold on to the horizontal aspect of it and the more you come closer to that communion, it's just the vertical, you might say, is so emphasized. Vertical meaning just pure spirit. And that's why I, when people talk about spirit, pure spirit versus the form of the world, I say that's the cross. And the cross doesn't have to be in like Calvary, it's, it's where the vertical seems to cross the horizontal. And Jesus was an example of that. He was really in communion with all and with God, and he just seemed to have a body that was walking, that, that was distinct. But that wasn't the truth of it either. Just so it's a misconcept to see that having a holy relationship with someone there, and a hate relationship with another one there, that's impossible. Yeah, you, you might say that, that the holiness has to extend, just like Kirsten said, that uh, every relationship is a total commitment. So if you try to say, this one's holy, I've got a total commitment with this one, but not with that one. So if I'm not with the other one, it, it's, it's just saying you don't have a commitment. Exactly. To say you have a total commitment with one and not a total commitment with another. That's like saying, you know, you're, you're partially pregnant. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's just another trick. Because healing is never partial. The healing has to be whole. Yeah, it's like the commitment. The commitment is what it's for. So the commitment to holiness, to holy, to holy relationship, is really between with my own mind, or with my mind and God. And then if one is given, and it's called a partnership, or it looks like a partnership, 
you know, it could be called holy relationship. But really, it's for the practice of this and to see where there's a lack of commitment or a fear of intimacy or a fear of open communication, or, you know, all kinds of avoidances and, and everything. But that commitment, yeah, it seemed, it's here with this one, but it's because it's in mind, then it has to be with every. With every so one. if you shift the purpose of one relationship, seemingly, you will change the purpose for all relationships you have. If you don't make it like special for you. Yeah, that's transfer of training, just what you're describing, because you're transferring it in your own mind, just naturally that commitment, that love, mm -hmm. that awareness transfers to them with everyone you meet. Yeah, you know, this whole thing, relationship, reminds me, it's the same thing, we could talk about it in terms of possession. Um, Jesus says that in this world, if you divide a possession, you split its ownership. So if you had like a bank account, you divided the bank account, you'd have less. Um, and if you divided uh, an inheritance, you'd have less. If you divided property, you have less. Um, so holy relationship um, doesn't operate on those premises. It's, it's the sense that all that you give, you give to yourself. The purpose that you give with one relationship, you, you must give to all relationships. And you can see where <coughs> this completely dissolves away jealousy, for example. Because it dissolves away comparison. And it, it also means you can't determine what the relationship is by how it looks. Which is where the problem comes in. It's believing that our mind can be informed or, or we can receive information from the form. So someone could say, uh, well, I see uh, you're spending a lot of time around this one. Uh, you spend more time with this one than that one. This is what actually happened in the days of Jesus. That out of all the twelve apostles, the one that Jesus was most publicly affectionate with was John. And then we have the Gospel of John, and John is described as the one whom Jesus loved. <laughs> the one whom Jesus loved. It's a perception. But, but you see how it, if you try to pull from the form and you saw that there's two guys that are more affectionate. <laughs> then that's again, see that's a good example. <laughs> Here's the form, they're just affectionate. John puts his head on Jesus' lap and then, are they gay? You see, that's exactly describing what I'm talking about. Where you, where you see a form and you, and you try to infer a meaning from it. You see how it works? That's how the ego works. We were talking about that in our one-on-one -on -one earlier, about how we just need to let go of concern for this idea of what people think, or the boxes and categories. And the more trusting we are, in the love, and the vibration of the love, and the more unconcerned we are about the form, the better. We're actually because the form is actually just creating the separation, and creating all the time. Sport, the form's kind of a reflection of it. Oh, yeah. That's why it's, it, it doesn't have any power. So why give it power? Why say, oh, I'm going to infer, because you're spending more time, or, you know, I mean, I did a session, I did a session years ago, in, I think it was in Kentucky, and um, I did the whole section on undoing specialness, and it was really intense, because we, we used the course and we went down real deep. And afterwards, some woman, who's a friend of mine uh, named Beverly, came and sat on my lap. And you should have seen the looks, <laughs> and the glares, and the glances. Just no different as if like a little puppy dog wagging his tail would go, would come and jump on your lap. Now there would be no glares probably if you do a whole session on specialness and a puppy dog jumps on your lap. But when a woman jumps on your lap, then everyone's like, you know, because it's it's thinking that the form is means something that you can infer from the form. And 
look what Jesus does in his workbook. He starts out of the first lesson in his workbook is nothing I see means anything. I, and his number two is I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. He's purposefully showing us that all the meaning is being generated from our consciousness and our mind and that the form means nothing at all. It just means whatever you say it means. It's entirely subjective. And all the meaning we give is actually that everything is beautiful. Yes. Yes. I just want to mention too that um, holy relationship doesn't come to an end. Well, the, tr the truth of holy relationship doesn't come to an end. That is the whole purpose of entering into holy relationship. It's to experience that the love does not come to an end. Special relationship is, you know, the ego's idea of love and the ego's idea of relationship, which is about people or bodies, or, you know, bodies being together about a special one and you can seem to come together and then it can break apart you know, and then there seems to be a lack of love and a heartache but the whole purpose of holy relationship is to open your heart and your mind to an experience of love, of truth, of union that cannot come to an end so that even if the guidance is that that particular assignment is a shift and the bodies are no longer to be spending so much time together or the guidance may be that the type of intimacy is not the same as it was. The purpose doesn't come to an end because the purpose was always to know true love, was to heal the mind. And then what a gift that this one was given temporarily in support of this holy relationship. Yeah, so the commitment is that when you say yeah, it's it's total commitment with everyone. Mm -hmm. Then it ha it's a total commitment to see everyone as the Christ, right? Just not to confuse it with the form. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> that has yeah. to be it, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a commitment of purpose. The holy relationship is a commitment. And then if we're given to join, like even if it's just for these five days, every time we meet, there's a commitment to be present, to be listening, to be fully present in every encounter. That's that's the commitment. So it's the commitment of purpose. To use everything that comes up for the healing of the mind and to keep the heart open to love. So I'm not committed to to a person or a body. I mean the bodies may go apart. I'm not responsible for what happens for another person when we're not together. It's letting go of that kind of responsibility as if it's for a person or someone else's happiness. But it's for being being together. And when there's any thought of each other, it's being totally committed with that, that thought or that guidance that, that's yeah. here. Yeah, you can really see that the, that, that word responsible is, is is so tied into the guilt that when we tie down responsibility for, we'll say, our state of mind, when we tie it down to form and we try to take responsibility for the form, we are walking right into guilt because, because the form never works out the way we imagine it. We, we're just trying to imagine it all the time and it never lives up to our expectations. So whenever that responsibility is tied to form and to linear time, it's, it's destined to produce guilt. And our goal is innocence, our goal is peace of mind. So we have to start to take full responsibility for our state of mind. Even when we're upset, we can't just justify it and say, well, look at this, look at this, look at these reasons. I've got good reason to be upset. We can't do that anymore. We have to say, hmm. I'm never upset for the reason I think, and then work it in, like I'm holding on to attack thoughts, I'm holding on to grievances, I'm doing this to myself, and I can stop doing this to myself, in a mind way, not in a personal way even. Because once we make it personal, then we start to put it on 
to our personality or to our body. Oh, I should have done something better, I could have done this better. And, and if you do that, you, you may have what seems to be psychosomatic. The body can seem to get sick when you keep blaming it. And you keep blaming yourself. Instead of shooting the ray gun out at all the other people, you go, it's all me. <laughs> I'm the fault of everything. And then the body seems to take that on too and get sick. So we have to learn to just realize that we aren't responsible for the error. We aren't responsible for the behavioral level. That the behavioral level will flow from our thoughts and we are responsible for lining up with God. We are responsible for choosing the miracle. You know, that's where our responsibility is, fully. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's, like, it's just a little confusion about this being fully present, you know, you're, you're saying, um, when we're here. Because, I mean, it, it easily gets into this, again, this uh, people-pleasing and just, you know, yeah, it's just discernment. But presence, it's not even to a person then, it's just present, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, then yeah. I did it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because you think of even if a relationship seems to come to an end, you know, and you're no longer together, but the thought of them comes into your mind all the time. So you can say, oh, we're not in relationship anymore, but you know it's not true. If that one is still in your mind a lot, then you're still in relationship. It's, and so the forgiveness continues, the healing, the learning, the forgiveness. So it's like the, even the, the people in form, really they were all thoughts. People are thoughts. And those thoughts can seem to be in our own mind when we're practicing with that. Or the people seem to show up in form. So it's all a reflection of thoughts for, within this holy relationship of healing. Because the, the linearity is the thing. If, as long as you're into the linearity, then you've defined the relationship. It's got some kind of a concept or a box. And as soon as you do that, then it's, it's subject to all the, the ego's laws, which includes breaking up. And what happens when the relationship <coughs> breaks up? There's, then there's this huge need to, to justify it. Your mother's on the phone, how's so-and-so doing? Well, uh, they're, they're not here. Oh, they're out on a trip? No. They went to the grocery store? No. When are they coming back? They're not. What happened? You know, you, then you have, suddenly you have to justify what happened. And the truth of the matter is nothing happened. <laughs> because the relationship is, a, is a, of the mind, you know, and, and oh, the body is just not there anymore. But, but see, why would you have to explain that? Why do you feel such a, a need to explain that? Not only to your mother, your father, your, your siblings, your everybody else that you know, your best friends, but to yourself, you're always justifying, well, you know, it just got to the point, it was just too I couldn't handle this anymore, <laughs> and I let it go like 15 times, but that, oh, that's 16th time, that just got me. I just said, that's it, get out. You know, you see the mind's doing a justification, it feels like it needs to justify the breakup. Just like it's doing when it has to justify the getting together. <laughs> out of all the, the produce you could pick, you pick one, <laughs> And then you've got to really justify why you picked that one. You see, it's the same mechanism that goes on in the mind. There has to be a reason for it. Not that it's just the flow of life, it's the flow of what's happening and you're practicing with your mind training, which is where all the attention needs to go. Oh no, you've got to justify the forms. Either why you came together or why you broke apart. <laughs> She's waited patiently <laughs> so, with the microphone in her hand, as the hands are going. patiently than I I think when, when the Course is speaking about entering the Ark two by two, um, 
Det var sådan, Ark. Ark. Noah. Noah and the Ark. Noah's Ark. Figuratively. The entering the Ark 2.2. Two. Um, can mean that two persons go together and live under one roof and make a decision to to this commitment um, to be the safe place where it is allowed to, to flush up whatever might come. That might be the commitment and entering an ark. But I think it's, it is meant to be every time I meet another being, then I can choose to enter that ark of safety and make that meeting holy. So actually, every meeting is a holy meeting if you choose so. Yeah, exactly. It, it is. And, and even that, that line, the Ark of Peace is entered two by two, again, there's lots of metaphors in the Course. And for a Course that's all about oneness, it speaks in terms of two much of the Course. I'd say most of the Course has those two-ness metaphors. And, I've actually been with friends that start to go through these real mystical experiences where even that starts to sound funny. Those, those passages in the Course, they kind of outgrow those even, where they can't, there's no box for those lines anymore. The Ark of Peace is entered two by two. And when we say commitment, it really is a commitment in the mind, and it is a total commitment. So, that's just a construct but we say two people make a commitment to each other. Um, that's still a construct and a metaphor. Because in the ultimate sense, you're going for atonement, and atonement is a total commitment, but it's also not a commitment that, that is toward time. It's more, it's more taking you toward eternity, that commitment. I mean, it can be your boss. If you go to speak to your boss, you can, you can choose to make that a holy um, uh, instant and a holy meeting. Um, <coughs> and you can also choose to live apart, but still have a decision to make that a, a connection that is just for flushing up and relieving guilt and fear, however it might look like. Um, it's interesting so though because... It's just uh, a couple, it's not uh, depending on, on, on geography, where you are in bodies and, and places. It's a question of a decision to, to make the connection holy, I think. It, it can be in the sense that as long as the mind believes in personhood, then, then it also believes that persons have choice and make choices. And the deeper you go, down the rabbit hole, you start to realize that, that, that persons are constructs, and that it's all mind. You, you know, that's part of what we were kind of getting at the movie last night, where we were going way, way down, down, down. It, that at the level of, of persons and the level of form, those metaphors have meaning. You know, the spirit has to use what's meaningful. But as you go much deeper, then, then they fall away too. Like Helen Shuckman and Bill Thetford, you know, Jesus, for, they were research psychologists. They weren't spiritual gurus. Uh, they were research psychologists. And so, if you go through Absence from Felicity, you see all these metaphors where Jesus is talking about time metaphors, like <coughs> celestial speed up. People were being called all over, from all over the universe to come and take their part as part of a celestial speed up. Then I get people who come to me and they go, wait a minute, if time's not real, how can you speed it up? It's like a, a, a speed up of an unreal. And I, I say, very good, you're, you're noticing that there's things that are meant to be stepping stones and at some point you, you even start to question the metaphors, the steps. Or with Helen and Bill, Jesus kept using these ideas of past lives and what they were in other lives to show the patterns in their mind. And so Jesus said, well, at one point, Helen, you were a priestess and you actually killed Bill. Now, that's just assuming the still personhood, the past lives, <coughs> you know, it was helpful to show the patterns. But yeah, you go a lot deeper, you start to ungrow, you outgrow everything eventually.
you empty your mind, like the Buddha said, you do have to empty your mind of everything eventually, but, but it's practical. It relates. Yeah. <laughs> I, take, I take the chance to ask this question. I have a big problem with my teeth. That's the mind reason why I travel to Denmark to see if I could get some insight and you really help me. Well, what is it about the perception of your teeth that, that bothers you? What, what troubles you? Um, the last six years, it started totally collapse of my teeth. Holes and teeth falling out, and so on, and so on. And I went to the dentist, I get it fixed, and it continued, it continued, and it's still going on. So what's the problem? <laughs> um, it takes a lot of my time giving me wor um, the shivering, worries, yeah. worries, because I, I can feel it all the time. And I smile when I move my... I can feel all the holes and, and part is falling off and so on. Well, part of this life of, of trust in the Spirit is, is that we learn that the Holy Spirit will give you everything that you need and will renew it as long as you have need of it. So, it applies to everything. We were talking about how practical this is. So, uh, yeah, we. <coughs> In all of our encounters with people over the years, we've had lots of teeth stories. Mostly car stories. I, I, amazing, a glut, many, many car stories. But we've had pretty many teeth stories too. And the question often comes down to, to the purpose. What is it for? Um, I guess one of the most recent teeth parables that we've had was one of our messengers of peace um, had a hole uh, where a tooth was missing and had some had crooked some crooked teeth um, right in the front, <coughs> front on the top and lower and then we have community property everything is shared uh, we don't have private ownership or private funds or private anything. So, here was one of our, it would be like one of the Franciscans or one of the Essenes going, I've, I've got some teeth things going on, bringing it up for the whole group. And so the group kind of prayed on it and, and shared, and basically the feeling was, I guess it came up in the group, that the whole the funds could be used for fixing the whole. <laughs> But not for the the other the were seen as cosmetic. Uh, replace the hole, but not the cosmetic, and then also put it out for help funding help. And that's exactly how it played out. It just just recently ended where there was an implant put in, and, and, and a, it was one where the tooth was replaced. I have another friend too who's in. Um, in China, and she's living a very simple life, like a traveling sannyasi. And we've, I've had some emails back and forth with a, another friend of mine who met her, and who said, "Listen, I feel I, I want to donate money so you can go to the dentist, um, like a, a periodontal disease with the gums and teeth falling out, and as the world would describe it." And, and basically. Uh, it turned into all kinds of forgiveness lessons because um, my one friend sent the money across over to China and said, here you go, get your teeth worked on, have treatment done. And my friend in China, who's such a, she just lives such a simple devot devoted life just traveling around, she gave away <laughs> half the money to charity that was sent. 
And then the woman, the friend who sent the money came, contacted me and said, what do I do here? I just gave money for teeth and it's not being used for teeth. She's got such a big heart, she gave away half the money for the teeth to charity. And then it was still, every gift that we give, you know, has to be given freely. We can't, we can't have strings attached. Otherwise it's not really a gift. You see how everything gets used in terms of, of the principles in mind. And the teeth are just part of the props, they're part of the, the props of the, the theater of everything that's happening. So, it's not like something like, uh, this isn't like Louise Hay where you, where you are going to get instructions, go into your mind and here are your teeth grievances that you need to, to pluck and pull out. It doesn't really work that way, it, it just, it's part of an opportunity for opening and developing with, with trust. With trust. 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 That, that as you fulfill your function, which is what we're asked to do of forgiveness, as you fulfill your function, everything that you need, truly need, will be provided and renewed for as long as you have need of it. And, and I find that those are again are more opportunities. You know, with whatever the ailment seems to be, whatever the discomfort seems to be, it, see, it still all fits back into that core thing of, of, of trusting and, and having things provided that are, that are needed and helpful. And I know that also teeth can heal themselves. I've seen it so many times. So, yeah, it was funny, I was just on Facebook last week and they just discovered a new uh, technique for the teeth. It was just a brand new um, discovery that, that has never been a part of dentistry in all these years of dentistry. They discovered for the first time that if they, they fire like a low level laser beam at the teeth, that that it activates this, this thing that's within the teeth, that teeth need to grow from this low level laser, and that actually they can regrow teeth now. From this discovery, it just was on, it was in, on Facebook last week where they fire this low level laser, and it's still in the experimental phase, they're working on rodents right now, they're firing laser beams, low level lasers on rodent teeth, and they're watching the rodents grow their teeth back. You know, we shouldn't think that we know what anything is or what it's for, but we should trust that, the, that there is a way, always, with the Spirit, as we fulfill our function, everything that we truly need will be provided. And anything we feel even a discomfort with, you know, again, that's, we take it back to our mind. We, we use it as terms of practicing. So in that sense, everything is used in the, in the healing process. Nothing is pushed off to the side, as if it's a separate problem, apart from the one, one problem. so exhausted when I wake up in the morning. Um, and I have asked the Holy Spirit and I've tried to give it over and to relax, but it is still a problem for me. Um, and I don't know what to do. I just, I have to accept it. And just, uh, just 
way into it and see if I can release it. But um, it has not been possible for me yet. So, um, <laughs> do we have any suggestion? Well, I can share that um, back in 2000 and 10, I did a, a six-week retreat over here in Mallorca, and a friend of mine um, was there during the six weeks, and she got into this cycle where she absolutely could not sleep, day in, day out, <coughs> and then the days mounted, and then the weeks started to mount. And it does relate to actually everything that we've talked about today, including the movie last night, in the sense that the more the days went on without sleeping, the more her mind turned frantic, absolutely frantic. Frantic is uh, Very afraid. Yeah. Very, very afraid, almost like a panic, moving into panic states of of trying to find the problem. Remember how I said everyone who comes here is a problem is a problem solver and, and is a problem finder. And and what happens is it as the weeks went on and, and the sleeping there was no sleep. She was it was the I know mind going crazy. It was, first of all it labeled the condition as sleep deprivation. And it it, it thought it knew research on what happens to the human being when you go for so long without, without any sleep, sleep deprivation. And then, it, all that it knew about the, the symptoms and how dangerous it was to health and how dangerous it was dangerous to mental health and on and on and on. The I now mind just started to get more and more frantic. Um, and, I remember praying and praying, we us joining and joining and praying into that. And really what it was, what it came down to was, it was this, again, fear of the meaningless. It, it, that was, the more it just started to, the mind to dip down and touch upon the meaninglessness, that's where it was going crazy. That's where the, the intense fear was coming up. Because it was like, it was like saying, I'm a problem solver and I have to find the problem. That was underneath the craziness. I have to find the problem. And it was like we would just pray together and be together and be together and pray together through through all of it. And, and it didn't break until she actually recognized that that what was going on, that it really wasn't about the sleep. You know, that was like the big distraction. Uh, it, and it was this, this, almost like there was a control with having to know what the problem was, in order to come up with, to generate the solution. Which is really, I'd say, at the bottom of the whole human condition, except most of us don't get pushed to such an extreme. We don't allow ourselves to take it out that far, but this this was someone who was very dedicated to spiritual awakening, and, and that's where the breaking point came. I remember after praying and praying and praying, it would just be I would be joining with her and saying, "Can you just let go of of the defining of, of trying to define it?" That's where the it was going crazy. She was just holding on desperately to the definition. And that's what we've really been talking about the whole time. And, and even last night in the movie, you know, when he finally suspects there's something amiss, and he discovers nothing is as it seems, when he first comes back to his, his friend, um, played by Scarlett Johansson, she's going to the island in her mind. She's just all, oh how sweet! He comes to the door, how sweet you're coming to visit me. Oh, he's not coming to visit her for that. He's got something to tell her. And more than that, he's not even going to tell her, he's just going to grab her hand. Come with me. You see, he knows there's something much deeper there that they've got to both address. And it's not that she's going to the island at all. 
at one point, it, he's, in the elevator, he says, you still believe there's an island? You know, because th things have to get rinsed away. And that's really what's happening. That's what's going on. Uh, this is like a spiritual emergence or a spiritual awakening that you're going through and it's just taking the form of, of the, the concern around the sleep. That is also my own thoughts. Yeah. If not just lying and get this electric, it's like electric uh, power which is going through my feet and slow or I'm, I'm, I'm getting crazy because ah, and, and I don't have to do that because that's so we go and do it both. So yeah. I just have to accept it. Yeah. It's what I can use. Yeah, it's, it's actually a call into mind training because remember, the healed mind, remember those three conditions that we started off with? You know, it does not know the outcome which is best, you know, even around the sleep, it would, wouldn't know the outcome which is best, nor the means by which the problem is solved, and what was the third one? The, the problem? The problem. The problem. problem was made to solve. That was the third one. Then what was the second one? Deliberation. The means. Guidance. The means. Yes. The means. The first was outcome, means, and then the problem the plan was meant to solve. So those are real practical because you can see how applying those opens you to healing of mind, which is really what you want. That's the prayer of your heart. You're calling for healing of the mind. And, and as long as those are defined then there seems to be a panic around trying to find the problem. That's really, it's like, I can't handle the meaninglessness, I have to know what the problem is. And, and I find, one time I, I visited California, and I visited a friend of mine, and when I went to her and I spent some time with her, she just told me, I have this lifelong problem of, I can't sleep, I don't get, enough sleep, and, and it was really strong, because she, it, was like, she said, it wasn't a few years, it was like, this is a lifelong problem. It's like my major, whatever, defect or whatever. Except I was in a state of mind where I don't see any problems. <coughs> so when my state of mind, which I don't see a problem, I'm certain there isn't one, came together with her belief that she had a major sleeping problem. We meditated together, we rested together, and we just spent the night together. And the next morning she went, oh, that's the best night's sleep I've ever had in my life. No problem meets problem. Light meets darkness and only light remains. It took the form for her, symbolically, in a way she could comprehend it, was that's the, and she fell asleep in my arms, literally, and, and she had to surrender everything. She had to surrender a whole history of a belief that she couldn't sleep, but she did. She, I just admired that willingness to just totally trust and surrender into that, and then, then she fell asleep. And she, she was so happy in the morning. But they don't like you lost, but I don't want to sleep again. <laughs> okay, very good. Remember, that's number two in here, that you can't, you can't decide the means. <laughs> well, maybe starters have gone to court for that. <laughs> They may have gone to court, but it's still, this is Jesus Christ, this is your book. This is your book, it's right, I just, I just read it. <laughs> the court doesn't, doesn't like Jesus. <laughs> the court doesn't like Jesus. Thank you. How are we doing? Do we have time, a little more time if anyone... Just one question. Yes. Yeah, one more question, we'll try here. Actually, it's not a subject for now. 
I don't know, it's just very essential for the cause, uh, at least my impression, is this forgiveness thing. And I just want to hear if we're getting into that during those days, because I, I haven't done the course for that long, and I just would like to, to get some advice on this forgiveness. How, how do I use it, practically? And I don't know if we talk about that now, but maybe the next time, the next couple of days, I'll yeah, actually, that's really all the Course is about, and really all of this retreat has only that aim. Whether we use the word or not, whether we're watching movies, whether we're having discussions like this, it's like that is the one goal, that is the one goal, the one aim. Now, what it is, just like that passage I read about a healed mind is relieved that it of the belief that it must plan, that paragraph was talking about forgiveness, but it didn't mention the word forgiveness in there, but it was the whole paragraph was about letting go of, of the, the goal, the means, the outcome, you know, all of that is like a surrender. And then when you surrender everything, when you really surrender all your concepts and ideas, you, you have a realization that there's nothing to forgive. In other words, it's kind of funny that forgiveness would be, complete forgiveness would be the experience that there's nothing to forgive. It's, it almost seems like a contradiction. Like how can, how can forgiveness be that there's nothing to forgive? But that's the experience of, of true forgiveness. It doesn't first say that there's an error or a problem and then figure out a way to deal with it. It sees that there was no problem, which is what we've been talking about, you know, with this part we just read. It's so different from the world, which the world's teaching of forgiveness is, there's been an actual wrongdoing. Somebody's done something really wrong, and now we have to figure out a way to delete that. It's already there. We have to, like a sin is a sin, and you have to find a way to, to get past the sin. You have to, you either, some people even believe that you have to be forgiven by God. You know, that's a common one. And then you get to the Course and it says, God does not forgive, for He has never condemned. And there must be condemnation first before forgiveness was necessary. So, even that gets taken away. This idea that God has to, only God can forgive you. God is so perfect and so loving that God doesn't even know of forgiveness, it's the Holy Spirit that is the one that's helping us release the illusions. So, a very simple definition of forgiveness would be releasing illusions. But, if we believe illusions are true, you see what a predicament that puts you in. Now, Jesus says, you, you are trying to forgive what happened. You're trying to forgive the truth. And that, we are not capable of forgiving the truth. The only thing we can forgive or release is illusions. And we have to be convinced by the Holy Spirit that they are illusions. So, what we work on is we don't try to heal from the top down. We don't just start off with God is love, all is love, all is one. You know, we, we say, what do you feel? What do you believe? What are you thinking? It's okay. Let it up. Whatever it is, it's okay. And we'll join together in joining with the Spirit to see that that, that can't really take your peace away because it doesn't have any validity. You see, it's so deep though, that we're constantly, this whole retreat is aimed at that one experience. Whether we call it that or not, that's exactly what, what this is all about. But still, practically, if you have like an aggression towards another person, I can say, I will let go, and I know it's an illusion and everything, but still it's there. Well, let's, let's look at that. If you have an issue, we'll say, with another person, and you're being trained by the workbook, like I have given everything, I see all the meaning it has for me, then really our issue with another person is trying to see 
a, a grievance, or we'll call it a misperception, as if it is outside of our mind. Mm. It's as if it's in the person. Like, they have their own private mind in there, and their motivations, and they, it's bad, it's evil. What they did was evil. Their evil deed, their evil behaviors came from evil thoughts. And now how do we forgive their evil thoughts? Not us. Oh, we're, we're decent, happy people, you know, we mind our business and we're going about our life. But them, they've got the evil thought over there and the evil behavior. There's no way to forgive in that scenario. We have to be convinced that what we see as outside is not outside at all. We've, we're holding a grievance in mind and they're acting it out for us. They're actually helping us see what it is. But, so you see, it's, it takes a lot of practice. And what I do is, I have spent many, many years really refining and talking about forgiveness in many different ways. But I call it 1% principle. And I say the spiritual journey is 1% principle and 99% practice. We have to practice, 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 practice. It never ends until you get to a point where you have this peace and, and the practice is gone. But that's, you know, realistically I tell people that's the way it goes. Because there's so many thoughts and so many things coming up in the mind that it's really like constant practice. Yeah.